a choice. You know, the longer you stay in the business, you kind of life, life gets a hold of you and you kind of go on that one track. But right now, you have so many options and that's amazing. And I think presentations like this are really important and to go to as many of these type of presentations as possible so you can actually see all of your options. And it's, it's like you can pick and choose. It's like going to the store. Well, I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to do that. So the fact that you guys are bringing in the produce technically to you <laughs> and they're actually coming in and telling you what your options are, that is smart business. Um, so if you guys are doing this entrepreneurship, um, that is a great marketing tool, and I am absolutely impressed um, with whoever came up with that idea, and I hope the team came up with that idea, because that's even cooler, um, but you guys should give yourselves a round of applause, because that's small business. That's really cool. So, let's go into what we're here for today. Um, immersive storytelling. I have been in this a long time, um, but I want to talk about stories just for a second. Uh, on the story end of it, I've been telling tales since I can't remember. Um, and a great storyteller just wants to tell stories. Okay? So I'm going to tell you a story of Sprocket Creative. All right? And some of the things we do. Uh, Sprocket Creative is five years old. Uh, it works with actually an apprentice program. And that apprentice program means that everybody who freelances with us came in uh, really not knowing anything except the skills that they had. We teach them process. We teach them actually how to finish. A lot of times you guys have all these skill sets, but something that you're lacking is the finishing. Uh, and that means on a professional level, where people are saying, that's not good, that's bad, you're fired. So we teach them like that. <clears throat> we have a great bunch of guys uh, that have come through the apprenticeship program. Uh, two of them are here. Uh, Christina and Christian. Um, what they do is they end up being freelancers for Sprocket. So they go through the apprentice program and then they become freelancers for Sprocket. I've worked with a lot of people. Um, this is like a quarter of the people I've worked with. I've had a long time in this industry and I get bored really easy. Um, so I jump around and do a lot of different jobs. I like a lot of different styles of work uh, from corporate to cartoon from tech to illustration, all of that stuff fascinates me. I'm gonna hold on to the, off on the demo tape right now. We're gonna, I don't know how much time we're gonna have. I'm gonna try and show all the videos at the end. So we'll just go through. But here would be a demo tape. Mm -hmm. And hopefully everybody would go, oh, they do a thing, and I'm impressed with the thing they do. So just try and have that feeling as we move forward. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so what I brought today is four different projects that we have worked on. Um, three of them are internal and one is external. Uh, we started going down this VR path about three years ago. So at that time, which, which doesn't seem like that long ago, but man, in VR, that's like 30 years. I mean, it has advanced so far and so fast and the perceptions of what it could be and what it was supposed to be have changed and they seem like they change daily. Um, so for us, a lot of the stuff, how we learned to actually build immersive stories was to build our own stories. Just to give you an example of what these are, <clears throat> Victoria Frankenstein is a ghost story. And it's basically, um, you're in a little bit further in the future and they found Frankenstein's castle and you have been hired to uncover the artifacts of Frankenstein's castle. So the VR component of this is you're looking at old videos because Frankenstein recorded everything. So what we come to find out is there were more monsters that were built besides the Frankenstein monster, um, a lot more monsters. There were more scientists because Frankenstein didn't do this alone. And there is a curse on this castle for all of the things that they have done, and you find out as you go through. Um, next one is Chimera's Rift. Chimera's Rift we built because we found that there was a problem getting into VR, and that was finding an entry point for new users. Everybody who's in VR usually comes to it because they're fascinated by it, so they do the work to go, how do I, how do I get the glasses? How do I spend, how much money do I have to spend? They do all of that, they're enthusiasts. 
But then there's everybody else, and there's a lot of everybody else's. So how do you get the everybody else's? Well, what we did was we built a board game. And the board game actually has uh, chips that are VR coded and AR coded. And what this means, if you think about Dungeons and Dragons or a game like that, where, hey, I'm gonna meet this dragon and someone's telling you, this is they're actually showing you. So you put the glasses on and you see the event and you find out what actually happened to you by flipping over that chip and there's an AR component that you can look at. Uh, the story behind this is you're traveling uh, through space, you can actually teleport. Uh, the teleportals have been broken and now space and time and even the subconscious is all wrapped up and mixed together and your job is to fix the teleportals as you travel through time. The neat thing about this, we did Victoria Frankenstein for ourselves uh, and Turner Classic Movies saw it and basically turned around and said, now do it for us. So this was, the same strategy was used in these, but uh, 360 degrees of noir is our probably biggest project we've ever built in VR and probably will be the biggest we ever built. Uh, and the reason being is it is seven episodes. It is actually an episodic VR story. So connecting those pieces and parts uh, was an incredible task uh, to get through. Our current project is story-based and not story-based. It's story-based that it is factual events that we're trying to uh, tell. But the dinosaur's name isn't George, and he doesn't have any personality. Uh, he's just a dinosaur, and he does things that dinosaurs do. Um, the cool thing about this project, it's our first foray into educational uh, storytelling. And this is actually just a new way to learn about uh, something that we all love, or most people love dinosaurs. Uh, and it's also our stepping stone to finally moving into the AR space. So a lot of stuff that is being done in VR Voyager is in conjunction with a lot of AR. And I'll actually show you an example of this AR poster that we're working with. Okay. I have 5,000 tips. We can only get through 11. In fact, I added the extra one today. I had 10 last night. One today. Uh, so here's the first thing um, that you really got to right. We're talking, we're not going to talk tech. Not that much anymore. Uh, we're talking story. And here's what messes up story right off the bat. Getting caught up in this. Okay? That's an afterthought. It should not be your first thought. Your first thought is what is the story? Concentrate on the story. Then put all the tech in there, and the story is going to change, and the story is going to morph and go left and go right because of the tech, but do not have the tech first, okay? Story is important. <laughs> the other thing is, I do not build for any of those in my mind. I'm building for immersion. I'm building that you feel like you're there, or you feel closer, or I can actually uh, speak to you on a different level and that is a physical level. Because the nice thing about immersion is you know what you're thinking, but if this room were hot pink and there were flamingos everywhere and let's say Bigfoot came in. And Bigfoot came in, your senses are getting screwed up while I'm talking about this. You're like, does anybody care that Bigfoot's in the room? <laughs> I can't hear this guy anymore. There's a freaking Bigfoot in it. Clashes with the hot pink, and I don't like that. So the point being is that you have this different way to tell a story where you can make people do things and feel things because they're immersed. An environment changes everything. An environment changes how you feel. So you, can, you can't do that. So let's talk about the tips. None of these are concrete, set in stone type of information. This is just what I feel is what I want to do and my team, and it's basically the direction for the team of we do this and we have certain things that are constantly there. One of them is when we first started doing this, we tried to wrap our head around what is immersion? What is this feeling and what can we do to put on a piece of paper that keeps us in check. 
that says this is what we're going to do. And we did research for, we've been in three years, but honestly, we've been researching for two. Uh, we've been researching for two and then started building, really building, after those two years. Um, and the research that we found was, has everybody here uh, gone to like a carnival fun house ride where things pop up? I mean, that's kind of a common thing. And, it, and the sounds, and it makes you go this way, and it makes you go this way. And you, and you know what's going on, but you can't really know what's going on because there's so many things around you. Well, our first, our first foot in the door was building basically a fun house experience. There's going to be a story, but there's going to be moments where you're going to look down and something's going to happen, or you're going to look up, and we're going to bring sound into that, and we're going to bring uh, movement into that to make you look where we want you to look. Good VR for me, when we do it right, is when the viewer is doing this. When they're everywhere, when their body is in the scene. Now we do passive VR, we don't do, I can walk through the scene, but we spin you the heck around. Um, and you're looking all over the place. So it's basically, you're taking a point in here, but someone comes into the room and runs this way, and then a spider. I don't know why, but it will be there. Um, so, it's, you're looking everywhere for like, what's the next thing that's going to happen to me? So, this is engagement. You're engaged in this to see everything that's happening. So, make them move, okay? Keep it short. Keep it short because basically most viewers are not ready for this yet. Now, if you have someone who already watches VR, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. They'll stay in there two hours. But when you're looking at an audience that has never looked at it before, keep it short. This project is 30 minutes of content. It's hard if you're a new VR uh, viewer because you're not really sure. It is so weird to watch a new person because they have this aha moment and then they get uncomfortable. They get uncomfortable because they can't see you. They get uncomfortable because they look silly. So they're kind of like, Oh, all right, there's a threshold that they, they, they get uncomfortable. Now, people who watch VR don't care. Uh, the other thing is, the worst experience in VR is being the person not watching VR and watching the person do VR. Because mm -hmm. that time is long. <laughs> like a minute seems like, it's like a day. <laughs> it's like, what am I doing here? So what we did was we actually wrote this as chapters. We went back to the old serial mentality and wrote it as chapters with a stay tuned for next week situation in there. So that this is all digestible and you have this pause to think about what happened and maybe even rewatch it a couple of times. So if you want to do something that is on the long side of it, uh, think about how to break that up. Think about uh, how to shorten it and think about if you need all that content. Use the space. I know, Billy. I know. I put one twice. So there's 12 tips. <laughs> so, Billy uh, is a project manager at Sprocket Creative, but he's also like a stickler for everything. So, he made a look. <laughs> we worked together over 10 years. He made a look, and I'm like, something's misspelled, something's wrong, something's this. So the whole time we were talking, all I'm thinking is, what is wrong? <laughs> what is on the screen that is wrong? Thank you, Bill. <laughs> so, number three, <laughs> use the space. The great thing about VR is it's six views. It's uh, up, down, front, back, left, and right. Okay? Why wouldn't you use all of those views? Why wouldn't you tell a story where someone can go, I'm going to stay here for a second. Ooh, a dinosaur. What's in this scene anyway? I'm going to go over here for a second. Statue of Liberty. Um, we write the stories to take advantage of that. <clears throat> so, you know, talking about stories and tech. The story of Chimera's Rift is written without the tech thought about. Then when we start doing the scenes, it's like, okay, why is it in VR? What are we going to do? Well, this is a scene where the teleportal has basically broken time. Okay? And this is actually the scene unwrapped. Um, so everywhere you look, there's something out of place. Right? Because it's a game, the whole nature of the game 
is that in this scene, you have a countdown to find a battle. So everybody's looking everywhere for this battle. And it's really hard to find that battery when there's dinosaurs and tanks and the Statue of Liberty. And I think there's a hot dog cart somewhere in here. Um, it gets really crazy. So again, tell the story from multiple angles. Presence. This is the coolest part. And I didn't bring my demonstration. Dang it. Christian, my dinosaur is not here. All right. We're going to use this solid thing, because I think this is easy. I need a volunteer. You. Okay. I need you to stand right here. Okay? Here. Yes. Okay. Does this bother you? No. <laughs> Does this bother you? <laughs> All right, thank you. It was better with the dinosaur. I'm sorry you just had to look at this great. <laughs> Presence. Being in someone's space. You can be about this distance from me, and I am not annoyed with you. But God forbid you're here. It's really bothersome. <laughs> Presence. When we started doing uh, these... Uh, engagements or these experiences, uh, we kind of built everything out here where you guys are. And there wasn't a change in my, my personal state. There wasn't a change in my body. Like, I didn't, didn't concern me. It was like, oh, this is just like watching a movie. I'm, I'm, I, can, I can look here, I can look here, I can look here. And then we had this opportunity uh, in Noir Alley to add an alligator. Because film noir is all about alligators. Uh, we wanted to add this alligator. And we wanted to do a test. And it was basically, what does it feel like when that alligator's all the way out there swimming at you and it is slowly coming to you? You have this moment of what's going to happen. If the alligator's just swimming out there, you're like, okay, alligator, I'm like nature show. But when it starts getting here and it swims by you, there's this moment of anxiety. We did a test. And the test was um, made a cave, and there's a monster in the cave. And the monster is here, and you're watching. The lights go out, and the monster is here. The lights go out, the monster's here. The lights go out, the monster's here. The amazing thing was everybody had to have the glasses strapped off was I was writing their body language down. And it was fascinating. Because what was happening was they, every time it took, and it didn't move. Every time it got closer, they got smaller. And they went like this. And they went like this. And, and, and Christian, who doesn't get scared of most anything, uh, actually turned around and said, ah. <laughs> because, because you don't know it's getting closer if you're looking at the other parts of the cave. So when you come back to that point, and that thing is right here with its hand, basically where I have my, um, the tablet in your face, every single person is, is basically almost taking a knee and cowering. So I asked the question after, were you scared? Everybody's uh, flat out no. Like there was anxiety and stuff, but I wasn't scared. I go, your body said something completely different. Your body was terrified. And that's when we started going down this road of there is a disconnect with VR and what physically happens to you. And that was when we had the run moment. That was when everything changed. Because then it was, huh, you're not scared or you're not feeling this mentally, but your body is feeling it. Now, does that mean anything with memories? Does that mean anything that you're not going to take that out? because it is a physical thing, and it is an instinctual thing. So we went further with pre presence as far as we could, moving into sound, moving into you know, how a scene is lit, and all of this stuff, and it was fascinating. Uh, it really is something that I haven't seen in any other medium, uh, which, is, which is crazy. London. Not everything has to be scary. 
not everything has to be trying to solve a uh, uh, social crisis. Sometimes it should just be peaceful. Uh, this is actually from Vier, Vier Voyager Outpost. And this is my favorite scene. And all it is is being somewhere you've never been before. And soft music and these <coughs> beautiful um, sea creatures. And it's awesome. It, it's an awesome feeling. Uh, and it's very calming, and I found that uh, amazing how quickly I could be calm. Uh, we did another test <coughs> about, um, you know, it was a garden, and you're a miniature in the garden. And Christian's whole thing in his whole life is that everything, every VR moment should be a miniature in something. You don't know why. <laughs> um, but, but it was uh, to basically uh, like tranquil Japanese music. And I just sat in there, and it had sparkles going all around. And I sat in there going, this is, like, this is what I want to watch after I'm in traffic. Like, if I had 30 minutes of this, not 30 minutes, 30 seconds of this, or, or a minute, or three minutes of just tranquility, man, how it easily moved me out of the emotions I had. Because one of the things uh, that you can play with in these environments is the fact that whoever is in here can only focus on this. So a lot of the testing that we've done, you're not thinking of your bills when this is happening. You're not thinking of traffic when this is happening because the world closes off. You have the headphones on, you have the glasses on, which are basically like blinders to focus on just what's <coughs> happening around you. And that's why it can move you so quickly into this different space. While if you looked at this on video, the world still exists. Other sounds still exist. The bills are still on your desk. The car keys that you had that you just hated as you came in because you're stuck in Atlanta traffic, they still exist. But putting those glasses on, putting those headphones on is like an isolation chamber of happiness um, where all of that stuff melts away. And it's amazing to, to actually concentrate on that feeling and go, yeah, I, that is happening. More on a tech thing. Um, if you're doing VR, understand, not everybody has the glasses. You have to figure out a way to get it to all of these monitors. That's how you're going to win. You can't even market VR if you can't get it to a computer screen. Think about that on your build. And not only think about that on your build, think about that in your storytelling. Because here's the thing. These don't have to be immersive in the same way. So let's say uh, when we were doing War Alley, we did, um, which, and I'm sure you guys know this term, a transmedia uh, roll-up of the pieces and parts. So what we did is you could, of course, look at it in your glasses. You could also pan across the screen. But we also had extra elements that we took from the 360 VR scenes. Um, and put notes, and put characters, and put all of this other stuff that we had already built into the story. So that if you wanted more information, you'd have to go and find a different, different means to get that information. Because all of that information was not in um, the VR engagement. Big deal. Um, if you're going to do, so now we don't do, um, except in production, we don't do um, video. Everything we do is motion graphics, animation, and 3D. So in Victoria Frankenstein, there's a part where you find a comic book in the uh, castle, and you find out that the castle actually is, um, the characters are still alive, and how much the, the castle has actually influenced modern times and literature, and this is one of the characters. Uh, one of the things when we built Victoria was every single character had to have a reason to be in a VR space. And what that means is if I'm a character and I'm talking to you and you're the viewer where the cameraman is, uh, we're over here, but I need you to be over here. So one of the characters has magic powers, so basically um, they're actually super science, uh, where it's like if you're the viewer, she's over here and she would pull you over here to where she is. She could move you around. This character is the Rosebat, uh, and what her power was, 
is that crown on her head gives her the ability to have these gravity bubbles. And these gravity bubbles means um, that she can pick up items that she could never pick up before, and she could have limited flight. So the cool thing with that was this mace, again, talking about this whole VR experience, if she's holding a mace here and a viewer is there, she can fling this mace and then pull it back. So she had all of these abilities to go this way and that way, and also the ability to um, semi-fly. It's a whole bone of contention about the semi-fly. It's still not... She should just fly. <laughs> um, her leaping is that she can clear distances in the room. So she could constantly go from one place to the other, causing the viewer to actually engage where she's at. Right? This one was a big one. Um, storyboards had to evolve. When we were doing this, so I've, I've been doing storyboards for a really long time and writing scripts for a really long time. And to actually come to a, a situation where it's like, my script no longer works because no one's going to look where I tell them to look. I have no camera, so how do you write a script with no camera? My boards no longer work because I can't say this is what the scene should look like because you could be looking over there. So how do we actually frame what's going on and how it's going on? Well, top view. Camera's on the ceiling, looking down, um, basically pointing out where everybody is and what the actions are. Now, this one is before we put one, two, three, like where things are happening. But these are all of the things that possibly could happen, which means that maybe they're on the roof. Okay? It's giving us options. Um, okay, what can we do with this puddle? Right? Is there something that we're going to have um, the sound of splashing? Is there going to be footprints? Uh, wet footprints that go to this door that lead you to go, okay, what's going on? <coughs> so if you plan what the room is, it actually allows you to start planning what the actions are. And then you start filling in the actions, and then you start going, okay, what has to happen when? And you just number them. This has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen, and this is how they're going to get there. Then you can start planning out the navigation. <coughs> How are they going to get there? Are they getting there by visual? Are they getting there by sound? So all of this stuff has to be thought out to make an actual successful experience. Okay. Navigation is crucial. No one is going to look where you want them to look. Mm -hmm. This is the <laughs> hardest part about VR for me. No one is ever looking where we want them to look. One little thing could hang somebody up where they cannot look away. Tell you a story. <laughs> so Christian made this beautiful scene of a gladiator fight off of the Statue of Liberty's torch. <laughs> but what he did not realize is that one of the sword maidens had a bronze uh, breastplate. And when you put it in VR, it doesn't look like she has anything on it. Unless you concentrate and you go, oh, I can see the ornate um, uh, engraving. So one of our <laughs> one of our viewers, uh, she, she just stopped, and I didn't even know what because we so we test everything. So so she's in the vibe, and here's the monitor, and she's looking around, and then it just stops, and I'm like, there's nothing going on. There's nothing on. Why is she just stuck there? And she takes it off and says, what do you think? She goes, I loved everything. Why are you putting naked people in it? And what the hell are you talking about? It's like, there's a gladiator. And I go all the way back. She goes, I just thought about that the whole time. <laughs> like, I couldn't even move fast. It. I didn't understand. I thought it was part of the story that you were going to explain it later on. I'm like, wow, you never know what's going to trap someone in a thought. Um, so you kind of have to build really, really smart. One of the things we did early on, like the first one we didn't have it as, as much as we should have. The first one we thought navigation could be, like if we're in this room, that there's a spot. And you're important, and now you're important, and now you're important, and now the door's important. Now you would assume that people would look where the flashlight is. Mm -hmm. They look in the dark. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're terrified. 
They're terrified of, of anything sneaking up on them. So they're always in the dark going, and, and we're basically going, nothing there. <laughs> nothing there. They will not look away from the dark. All of the things, we had spiders, beautiful spiders crafted coming out of the ceiling. We had uh, Frankenstein monster and saws and all sorts of things and brains being thrown. And they never saw anything. They're always looking to see what's coming behind. We do not do that anymore. Um, so assume your navigation is probably wrong until someone else looks at it. And you have to have a couple of people look at it to know that your navigation is working. It got to the point where we're like, you know what? We're not even going to try and do sneaky navigation. Bam! <laughs> look over here. <laughs> we don't even, we make sure it looks designed though. We make sure it's part of the story. Now, um, Noir Alley had a comic book feel to it, uh, actually a Pulp Fiction feel to it. So we decided that a yellow box, like a comic book box, was fine. In fact, if I had to do it over again, I would have even gone further. Uh, I was watching the Spider-Man trailer uh, into the Spider-Verse, and I looked how far they went. I'm like, man, we should have just went for it. We should have just went all out and gone and accepted that. Uh, but this was the important part of this navigation. There are uh, mobsters over here. So this is a big subway tunnel. So there's mobsters over here, right? So you hear the mobsters running, but, but you don't see them. They're little shadows. They're all the way in the distance. And we want to make sure that you see what they shoot at so you don't miss it. Because we knew if you're just looking at the mobsters, you'll see these little light flashes, but you'll never see them hit this target. So the whole point was, there's a sound cue, and then this pops up, so you get over here, and then we shoot the target. So a lot of the times, these yellow boxes were, were connected with the sound just to pull you in different places so that you could travel with the story. We do that for every single one now, uh, and we make sure we design it so it fits. More important than the navigation is the audience. Because how we build, we build very, very, we have a style that we build it. And the style is we do not want to overwhelm anybody with so much animation. We are not game makers, we're storytellers. Okay? So what happens is if there is too much movement in VR and you're trying to tell a story, you cannot hear the story. This is a true story. Um, I did a scene for Chimera's Rift. I, did, I, I think I did a great job. Had the story, had a lot of stuff going on, and I brought in Christina, I brought in Sabrina, and I brought in Billy, all at separate times, uh, to look at it. And what I was told every single time was, where's the audio? Okay. You leave the room. <laughs> Next person. Dean, I love this. I feel like I was punched with VR. Where's the audio? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now I'm thinking, all right, one more person. Billy, who has 15 plus years editing in the industry, do you, when are you going to put the audio on? <laughs> and it was amazing. Too much information has to rob another sense. So, months later, Christian comes across a, an article that actually says, too much visual stimulation will shut down your auditory senses. Now, I thought about that, how scary that is. Think about being in any type of military battle mm -hmm. and what that must be like and how, like, it was on another level just that aha moment of, you're lost. Like, your physical senses are shutting down. You can't override them. There must be so much training to override those senses because how do you hear what somebody is telling you when all of this, and it's a new environment, all of this environment is happening around you. So we started building differently. And we actually localized the animation. The animation is only here, in this box. Everybody else is like you're in a museum. Okay? So there is animation. There's beautiful things to look at but we're not gonna move everybody because you would never, so the point of this is it's an educational tool. You will never 
get any of this information if everything is exploding around you with dinosaurs and um, guys drinking water and there's babies in here somewhere, I don't know where. Um, but the important part was to make it still feel like movement. And how that was accomplished is there's first a music layer, and then there's a jungle layer, and then there's soft roars, and then there's focused roars, and then there's the sound effects for when the digital displays come up. And there's all of this sound happening around you, and it's in spatial audio. So there's sounds here that make you want to go this way, and there's sounds here that make you want to go this way. And you can actually feel the environment through sound. Right? So think about that when you're building something, how important sound is. Uh, also, navigation. Easiest thing with spatial audio. Dinosaur roars, you look where the dinosaur is. Uh, when this plate comes up, there's a beeping sound, you look where the plate is. We learn this in the worst possible way. <laughs> okay. Everybody who steps into VR needs to find ethics on VR before they build anything. Okay? So remember what I said. They're watching here. They're realizing what's happening mentally, but their body's doing something else because there is a disconnect. This scene was the first time we realized that, wow, we have a responsibility. <coughs> now, this will not happen to gamers, by the way. <coughs> gamers will not feel this sensation. You've got to talk about your other audience, your audience that is not a gamer, that is, doesn't, isn't uh, aware of VR. They're first-time VR people. So this scene, very tranquil scene right here, uh, a ghost is talking to you. And this ghost is basically saying that she needs to find her body. So you have this focal point. And the ghost keeps talking to you. Can you help me find my body? Can you help me find my body? And then you find out that the ghost has raised you all the way up in the air without you knowing. This was our best. We have not been able to create this again. And, and I think because people understand VR a little bit more, we cannot, I don't think we'll ever get this beautiful aha moment. So, the whole point was ballerinas. When a, when, I, I don't know how I know this fact. I don't know any ballerinas. Uh, I think it's from Sesame Street. <laughs> so, when a ballerina twirls, she does not fall down because she picks a focal point. Okay? And she has to concentrate on that focal point so everything else disappears. So in this scene, when you're on the floor and this light comes over and starts forming this ghost, well, there's your focal point. And she's talking. And she's telling you something compelling because how many days, you know, do you hear, I lost my body, <laughs> help me find it. Oh, that's fascinating. I'll listen to you, ghost lady. Um, then there's blue swirls that come around her, these energy swirls which mask out the rest of the scene. You can still see through them if you concentrate, but they're masking out the rest of the scene. And then she slowly starts floating. And the blue swirls are going. And when she dissipates, skeletons start coming out of the ground two stories down. I think that's cool. Here's what actually happens. I was at Coca-Cola. Uh, working, doing a freelance job, and one of the guys says, hey, what do you do? He was a distributor. And he goes, what do you do? I said, well, we do motion graphics, blah, blah, blah. They hired me here to do some brainstorming uh, sketches with the team. He said, oh, that's cool. I said, but we're doing some VR stuff. And there was a time where I would carry my VR glasses everywhere, like, look at VR, look at VR. Uh, and I was like, oh, I heard of this thing, this VR thing. And he's like, yeah, I'd love to see it. Put the phone in, slapped it on, gave it to him. And he practically threw the phone across the room, cursed me out, <laughs> and said, I am deathly afraid of heights. Oh. It's not real. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's the thing. His body, I'm so glad you said that, because that starts a topic. His body thought it was real. 
His mind, remember, it's, he's a first-time user. He doesn't know what VR is. This does not look real. You can't tell your body that. Uh, and that was this amazing moment of what is our responsibility for this? And we drop you. We actually drop you. And even though I've seen this a bunch of times, uh, Drew came over and brought his Vive, right? Or your Oculus. He brought over his Oculus, and it was the first time I actually saw it in the Oculus. We were only doing this in the mobile phone. And I put it on and watched the same scene, and my knees gave. And I'm like, I've seen this scene. I built this scene. I've seen this scene hundreds of times, and my knees gave. And it was like, that should be impossible for me, who knows exactly when it's going to happen. Um, so your body is not connected to your rational mind in VR. Right? That's important to realize that. L.A. producer. We should not have an L.A. producer come into our studio. We're not that big. She comes in, I heard th great things about you, blah, 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 and you're doing this VR thing. Again, VR is pretty new. Everybody wants to come and see it. Uh, it's a couple of years ago. She's like, and, and now we, we warn everybody. Are you afraid of heights? Mm -hmm. Are you afraid of spiders? Are you, are you into horror? She's like, I did Freddy Krueger. I produced Freddy Krueger. <laughs> like, I'm good. <laughs> she puts it on, gets to the scene, and she goes, hell no. <laughs> That's exactly what she said. No. <laughs> No, didn't think I was scared. <laughs> Not doing it. <laughs> Don't want to know what happens to me. And, it, and that has been, this scene has been a love-hate scene for me. Because I love this scene. And I hate the fact that, it, that a lot of people do not watch it all the way through. And we even got it where, you know, we even worked on the speed of the fall. So, I mean, it's a slow fall. It's more of a, a, a float down. But, but what we did was we did motion blur on the, on the scene, so it looks like it's moving faster, but it doesn't move that fast. So there's a lot of things um, that you have to think about. Um, respect your viewer. Number 11, that is actually number 12, right, was the failure on throwing someone in the dark became the whole methodology for keeping someone in the dim, mm -hmm. okay? Right? Being in a dimly lit room is just as scary as a room that's completely dark. So what we did was we actually focused lighting on places that you know something's up there, you know? You know someone's back there. You don't really know what their faces look like. And we did that specifically to keep you in that aha moment. So this is the scene of uh, Unwrapped. So she's actually behind you, and those three are in front of you. So you're constantly like, okay, I'm going to keep an eye on you, but I'm going to keep an eye on you. Oh, uh, crap, you're going to keep, oh, you're gone. Are you guys, oh, you guys are gone. Now she's there again. Now you're there again. Oh, she's a monster now. Damn it. <laughs> um, and, and what we did was we moved this, so you see this targeting? So we use still using navigation, but we, in here we use the, just a HUD to get you everywhere. Because you're basically this robot that's traveling the universe. And the HUD is for uh, locating this battery. So we just use that, and what's cool is it moves through the room to that. And then it moves to the other side of the room. So you're constantly, you're constantly looking where the HUD is. Because you know, wherever the HUD is, something is going to happen because it's, it's for seeking things. So you're already trained over time, follow the HUD. And that's how we kind of get the scares um, to work. All right. I'm going to show you a clip, short clip, of every single one of these, and then open the floor to any questions that you might have. So, this is Chimera's Rift. Might be. Can we lower the lights? Yeah. It's probably still going to be a little bit too. Okay. We can no longer get a signal to Chimera. 
We also are having difficulty logging on to your signal to bring you back to base. The teleporter was compromised. You have traveled further into the subconscious zone than any VRA ever has. You have teleported into the I repeat, you have been teleported into a nightmare dimension. The engineers are recalibrating the system. They should be able to get you teleported out of there soon. engagement you're already you're also stuck there like there's no I'm gonna get out of here <laughs> it's like uh, I can look this way or I can look this way ah crap so we wanted to play that you know you're forced to keep something behind you you're always forced to have something behind you also um, we didn't completely leave the lights out we brought them down brought them back up but in that darkness they still had the HUD saying that this is going to come, ar come around here. Right? This is going to be there. This is a scene. Is this the falling scene? Hmm. Oh, yeah, I have that. Let's go. Let's find where that is. My eyesight's really bad, by the way. I refuse to wear glasses for some reason. <laughs> this is the... No, that's This is the fall I don't think it goes all the way to the fall though. Oh. But it does show you how, and this is me recording this on the computer and moving it around on the computer. So in VR, of course, you'll be immersed in this whole scene. Out of jealousy by Victoria Frankenstein, Elizabeth Lavinza haunts Frankenstein's castle, praying that today may be the day she's finally put to rest. in it. Um, there's a lot of, uh, we don't, we have primarily artists that know tech. So most of the time, all of the consideration is in what the aesthetic is of the scene and a lot less into, okay, we're going to move here, we're going to move here, we're going to do all of this stuff. And we're actually, because we had that, it became our style. And then because we chose story, it became our foundation. Because this is, this is how you can hear things. This is how you can take everything in if there's some things that move and some things that don't move. Because um, the thing that people don't factor in is part of the movement is the person. Mm -hmm. Like most of the movement is the person. So let's uh, show you one from Prehistoric Voyager. and what, We'll do the Namara Alley first. Okay, this is the alligator scene. So, I'll, this one needs a little bit of setup. So, you are a detective. Um, you're not a detective. You are following a detective, but you don't realize the detective is also following you. It's kind of this weird play on who's in charge of this whole mystery. 
and you've just separated yourself from the detective, and now you're lost in the sewers, and you're trying to find your way out. What's that noise? The sewer! It's flooding! So they basically feed the mobsters to the gator. And the last one, and then we'll switch over to a, the AR component. Um, this is from our current project. The Air Voyager. Now this is an educational, so it's not exactly a story. It just tells information. It's, it's our solution to not being able to go to a museum. Carnotaurus's hind legs were well adapted for speed and strength, making them one of the fastest theropods. So we wanted to make VR Voyager uh, something different, something different than we've ever done before. Um, lights. lights back on, please. And it was basically so I can't talk to you guys at whatever age you're at now. So I want us to all roll back the clock. We're going back to eight years old to 15 years old. Okay, so that's your mindset right now. Right. Imagine if you come into class and your teacher goes, hey, we're gonna talk about dinosaurs. Before we talk about dinosaurs, let's see where they live. So you guys are gonna probably wanna get up for this. Come on. The camera guy's not gonna have a clue what's happening. <laughs> it's just, he's like, this does not work for me at all. all right. So, what we decided was, imagine, again, go back to eight to 12 years old. Imagine you come into class, and we're gonna talk about just dinosaurs today. Um, but first, before we do that, let's go and see a dinosaur in the wild. Can you keep up with the tablet? And let's go look at them really, really close. Yeah. Oh wow. And we and imagine we all have tablets. So we can all see different parts of this dinosaur. This hasn't been this is still prototyping. Christina's still working on it. But imagine like I don't know, like last night, I'm gonna be totally honest, it was like two hours of me making my own stupid movie. <laughs> Dean the dinosaur hunter. We're gonna sneak up on him. But it's a whole little scene, right? So with that, we also decided, and this is probably not on this new app. We also decided what happens if every kid has their own little pet dinosaur. So, <laughs> okay, ready? I got it. If not, Christian. Yeah, show it on your phone. I don't think I have the app on this. I have that. So you get a little pet dinosaur. So every kid in class would have it. Look at you, right now. <laughs> and then this one actually has like a little digital, digital screen that pops up. Yeah. 
design element of VR mm -hmm. to actually write a story to keep you involved and to keep you there because I have to step up my game mm -hmm. I have to do instead of going okay I'm, I'm doing this element no 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 I need you here so now there needs to be bubbles in the cup I need you here so now a spider needs to walk I need to bring you here so the spider has to walk across the wall and get to this window mm -hmm. those design challenges are, are, are ones I've never had to deal with and I've been in this, it's 27 years now. And to have something I do not understand uh, is amazing. So no, I, I think it's, and they do it. <laughs> 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 they bring the magic to it. I'm over there going, ah, it's not working because of this, this, and this. I think I understand the mechanics of, of people better, but they're bringing the craft to the table. One more question you have. Um, yeah, the second um, question is, um, do you think VR would get even more advanced to looking even more real, quote unquote, like an in insidious or, you know. Let's, you let's discuss that because I don't want to. Oh. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Um, Cause I'm, I'm, we I'm have a it. whole, we have, we need a whole hour to talk about the ethics of VR. Mm -hmm. and I'll tell you about the ethics of VR. VR, even when it doesn't look real, messes with your body. The more real it looks, the more real it is to your body. Mm -hmm. okay? Not only that, the memories of something that looks totally real, when it immerses you, is a real memory. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, if you're going through a garden and you're planting something, those are good memories. But now, let's talk about insidious. And if you were in that situation, and it looked real, and your body thought it was real, and your mind will release. Your mind will stop rationalizing <laughs> that this is not real, and it will be real for your mind, too. Do you need those memories? Well, I think it's like the same as like when you go to a movie theater, and they have like, right. you know, it's dark around the room, so you're, you're so not is the same. You. This is, it is 100% focus. A movie, you still have, you still have those exits. You still have someone eating popcorn. They should not have come to the movies. You have some with a cell phone, blah, blah, blah. You don't know if you should have laughed that hard. You're thinking about going to the bathroom. Uh, there's all of these things that keep you in reality. Okay, true, true story. Billy and I went to Vegas to check out some VR stuff in Vegas. And first one we did, which I hope everybody gets a chance to do this type of VR, um, is the you go in a warehouse, and it's an empty warehouse, and they just give you the backpack. <laughs> And you put those glasses on, in 10 seconds, I'm this big guy <laughs> with a gun. And I saw, you know, they, they let you see the gun in reality, and it's just this plastic gun. As soon as someone goes, and the switch is on, you're like, this is a real gun. <laughs> <laughs> I am a real sniper. <laughs> this is really happening. <laughs> and then you start shooting. 
in everything. <laughs> like everything. For some reason, uh, people are bad. <laughs> but um, there are moments, and I think this is this is important. Why why that? Like I remember everything that happened in there, um, but I wasn't completely immersed because it wasn't real. But there was a, a time where we. Uh, we got separated, which is really weird because you know we're standing like where you are and where I am, but I don't even see him, and he's somewhere else. Uh, and we come out of an elevator, and we have to go both meet on the roof of a building. And to get to the building, you have a walkway on the side of the building, just a ledge. Get to the ledge, and they tell you where to go. And I'm just standing there going, ain't happening. I can't move forward. Like, this cannot happen. I can't move and I walked, put my head straight, took a deep breath, and went, oh, we're walking. <laughs> yeah, I know, I look stupid. <laughs> but I can't get to the other side of the building any other way than this. And what Billy said was, he goes, and he put his back to the wall. It was like, through the wall! <laughs> like, because that's how he would have done it. There was also a helicopter that I had to jump on. Dude, I took a run. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not, you're going to fall. <laughs> So the fact that my body wouldn't even allow me to do this, in that experience, I cannot even imagine what it would do to me in a real experience. Now, that being said, if you select to do stuff like that or go, then it's by choice. But here's the facts. Parents let kids do anything. And at that point where you do not have a grasp on what reality is and that Yu-Gi-Oh ain't real, <laughs> there could be a real big problem of separation because you haven't been putting those thoughts in. You're not, what parent is going to go, okay, little Johnny, let's talk about virtual reality. What they're going to do is, hey, little Johnny, Merry Christmas. <laughs> You're in there for two hours? Great. <laughs> I'm going to go do something. <laughs> oh, you're out? Let's find you another realistic video to watch. <laughs> Go ahead, little Johnny, the whole day. Little Johnny is lost. Little Johnny ain't coming back. <laughs> so that's what I mean. As creators, we have to... I feel that I have an unfair advantage because I have a son. Um, and my son was brought up on Godzilla and all sorts of monster movies. But what I did is we watched the behind the scenes before we ever watched a monster movie. So I taught him what Godzilla was, I showed him what the suits were, I told him there was a body in here, I explained everything. So there was at no time that he had a disconnect from reality. That's really important. Sorry, a lot of parents don't do that. A lot of parents wouldn't even know how to do it. So we as creators have a responsibility. I have chosen, and my team has chosen, to be this, to go high illustration, high design, and to make it more like a storybook. And we feel comfortable doing that. Um, if uh, virtual reality becomes as real, and it can become way more real, um, I just don't know if we are ready to understand it. Um, and I don't think there's enough people that are building that that are taking those ethics in mind. Now, if you have those ethics in mind and you test the heck out of it, and little Johnny is still like, hey, cereal, this is Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see guys in my closet. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> you know, then yeah, well, let's go as far as we can go. Let's go to the holiday. Um, but you gotta take that into mind in creation. You had a question. Yeah. All the way in back. No, no I am uh, pretty impressed with the graphics. How many man hours does it take to make like one episode of that uh, noir alley? <laughs> <laughs> the first one, the first one took six weeks of ten people. The next one, four weeks, then we dropped down to two. The last one, so we had to air every, every Sunday, right, every Sunday. So we had to air for seven weeks every Sunday. The last one was started on the, on the Monday and finished on late, late Saturday night because we wrote the whole story. We, I don't know how this morphed into this. When we started this, we had a script and we had a, a user that was actually trying to figure out the story outside of the studio. So every time she got closer to figuring out the story, I changed the script around. <laughs> That's why there's a freaking alligator in there. <laughs> and I would change the script around, and I would change the script around. So by the time we got to the end, we had a secret Illuminati. 
We had a circus. We had supernatural owls. None of these were in the script. Uh, we had codes. We had, uh, is it you? We had a love triangle. We had all of these things just to throw her off track. So it was taking us, at the end, we had built a formula, and it was, we can finish one in a week. We can actually finish three minutes, three minutes in a week. Uh, but it was because we, we honed in on how to get faster and faster and faster. Like, these guys are, are so fast at doing this stuff. It's, a, it's, it's scary how fast they are. Do you have a question? Um, yeah. All right, yeah. Going back to the audio. How does your company classify like what sounds are going to trigger what emotions or create what atmosphere? A lot of it I do first, and then I find out I'm bad. <laughs> uh, I, I know how to do things that are loud. Uh, we actually have a really, really strong audio engineer designer, uh, Juan Baez, that does all our audio. He's got years and years and years of experience. He's 99% spot on with the audio. Uh, I usually come in and I'm like, ah, how? <laughs> like, but the thing is, that's all he does all day, every day, for all of these different projects. So for him, finding the audio that does something, uh, I wish he was here. He should do a panel just by himself on audio, to be totally honest. Um, because there's so much that he brings to the table, and he never gets uh, the light he should get because it's, it's, a, it's amazing what he can do. So I can't, I can't answer that question. He could. Yes? I was going to answer, um, do you use like Unity or Maya for your models or anything? <laughs> so, uh, when we started, we had never heard of Unity. We had never heard of Unreal. And uh, we used Cinema 40. Um, so when we started, we didn't even know how to, uh, we didn't have the, the um, VR plugins for After Effects yet. They weren't part of After Effects. And there wasn't a VR camera inside Cinema 4D yet. Our very first VR project was done by taking the, an image into Photoshop and pushing the pixels. We actually pushed them into space and, and warped them. Because what we did was we took a, a JPEG out of an iPhone that could do VR photos, and we made our own grid system, and we stretched it into the grid system. Uh, that was stupid. <laughs> it was tedious. It took a really long time. Uh, but we learned a lot, and then like the next day, they're like, oh, there's plugins. <laughs> uh, so we do After Effects. It's, it's done in After Effects. After Effects uh, was, uh, uh, bought a plugin called Skybox metal so it actually sets up the scene for you and then on the 3d side we use a couple of different programs but the models are actually DAS 3d so DAS 3d has these really elaborate models that have actual IK in them already and we take that that model into cinema for you to texture and light and to perfect the animation the only part that we're doing that's unity and this is brand new is that Christina goes into unity to build all of the AR. But that's, uh, how long has that been, a month? Two months? Not two months, five. two months. So two months is how long we've been. The dinosaur on there, uh, she trained for a month and then started building. Uh, Christina's kind of like this weird genius. <laughs> okay, any other questions? We're good? All right, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Billy Martin.